Thank you. Yep. Yep. It's due to the distance between incarnations. Like what happens is when the first half of the soul incarnates, because of the of the desire for the next half of the soul to incarnate now multiplies in desire, the soul will usually always incarnate in the same generation. That's why I said it's very, very rare for a soul to incarnate in a different generation. And the way God's made the whole structure is the incarnation process is very much part, a part of your sexuality. And as a result of that, it's a, uh, it's, it's, and when I say impossible, I don't mean it's like entirely impossible because nothing's entirely impossible due to emotional injuries. So the, the truth is on the planet today, due to emotional injuries, there are a lot of things that God didn't design to happen that now happen. So for instance, God didn't, didn't create the nuclear bomb, right? Mankind in a state of emotional injury created the nuclear bomb. And God never intended that man should create the nuclear bomb. If the man was in the state of love, they wouldn't have, but they did. And God's given them the free will to do it, so God's provided the laws that it can happen, but it happens because of man's desire. And the trouble with the analysing a lot of current relationships through these truths is that you're actually looking at them through already the filter of the untruth of what's happening on earth today rather than seeing them from the truth perspective. What's happening on earth today is very much influenced by the emotional damage and injuries due to a lack of love being on the planet, not due to love being on the planet. When we're in a state of love, actually, you will find that you can actually choose which soul incarnates when you conceive. Right? For many people, this doesn't happen right now, right? But you can actually do that. In the first century... Uh, myself and my soulmate uh, made love, and I chose through my intention. We chose together uh, through, and and it was because of someone I met before. Then we chose together who would incarnate into this little baby, that into this newly conceived child that we created, and that person became my daughter, Sarah. So you can do that too. Is it just? luck that I was incarnated to Australia as opposed to Africa? And nothing is luck. Right? There are a whole lot of spiritual, emotional, physical and, and environmental factors that influence the law of attraction of your parents that actually influence what type of soul they actually draw to them when they conceive. And it even changes with each conception as to what type of influences are occurring. So, so um, for example, in your, in your state, you were a female child attracted to your parents. And there was a whole lot of laws involved in even that attraction, that, that they had a female child at that particular time. Does that make sense? And that whole set of laws would be different with a whole with each new attraction. So each time a couple even makes love, there are a whole separate set of emotional conditions going on for that particular event, and that creates a whole different set of attractions. So it's not luck that anything occurs. It's all based on the law of attraction, but not on your law of attraction. It's based on a mixture of your personality being needed by that couple to trigger certain emotions in those couple, that couple that they're denying. Now, unfortunately, what happens is the couple has the baby, the baby starts triggering the couple's emotions, and then the couple suppress the child's emotions and, and maybe even beat it or abuse it or whatever and suppress their experience of the emotions the child is triggering. But the truth is that every single child incarnated is attracted because of the mixture of the personality of that child being needed by the parents to work their way through their condition and work their way through their desires and emotions that are both harmonious and out of harmony with love. So it's a very mathematical and exact thing. God actually knows, and I don't know by the way, but God knows who will incarnate to every single couple. Right? due to the emotional injuries and emotional condition and their desires and all of the law of attraction events that are going on for that couple. 
So it's a, it's a very complicated process, but simple in a way in that you can override it by your desire. Right? So once you're aware of it, you can start desiring things in a different manner. And this applies, by the way, with a lot of the things that happen on Earth. Currently, a lot of the things happen on Earth are automatic. You know, they're automatically happening without our awareness. Right? When you become aware of what's going on at the soul level, and you start exercising a different soul desire because you've cleared away emotions that prevent you from doing so, and you've actually enabled desires that allow you to do so, your desires start to build. And when those desires build, a whole different set of events can occur because you're now utilizing the laws of the universe in a conscious manner. And that's part of what I want to talk to you about, is utilizing the laws in a soul-based conscious manner, not in an intellectual way. Many of you have been taught to do it in your mind, right? What I want to do is help you get away from that and into the actual power of creation, which is all about the feelings and emotions and everything, the expression of the soul. Down the front here and then, and then Harry. Um, recently I saw a documentary where children were convinced they were in the wrong body and wanted to have a, a sex change. Yep. Um, yeah, what's that about? The majority of people who are convinced that they want to have a sex change are being heavily influenced by spirits and due to the emotional injuries that have been come into the child from the parent. So it's actually the parent's unhealed emotion that's causing an attraction to a spirit of an opposite gender to the child and the child then believes itself to be of that gender. And almost all of these kind of sex change things that occur due to spirit connection. So it's, the problem with a lot of the things that are happening on Earth today are occurring because we are out of so far out of harmony with love that, we, that, that we're attracting all sorts of spirits in all sorts of conditions. Now, to give you an example of this particular example, let's say I'm a spirit and I pass over and I'm a male. But I have huge injuries about my whole life being male. Right? Those injuries might include my was, I was abused by my mother, sexually abused by my mother. I was, I was always told that I was effeminate. Right? I was always treated like with anger and abuse from other males. So all my life on earth, basically, I was tormented for being who I was, an effeminate male. So I pass. Now, let's say one of the parents have a homophobic emotion within themselves that they haven't released, and they have a male child, oh, sorry, a female child. This spirit who wants to be, doesn't want to be male themselves, wants to be a female, Right? And there's a law of attraction established between the spirit and the person on earth, the newly created child on earth. Right? And that spirit will be attracted to that child and heavily influence that child in a certain direction with regard to sexuality and gender and may even convince that child that it's not of that particular gender itself. And that child may eventually, when it grows up, go through a sex change operation because of that connection with the spirit. Right? So, before you do anything permanently to your body, the rule is find out whether you have spirits attached to you causing you to have certain beliefs and, uh, and try to find out underneath of that what emotion inside of yourself creates that attraction. Work through that in love of yourself. Work through that. Get out the other side of that. If you still believe yourself to be in the wrong body, then you may decide what you want to do with that. But don't make decisions without being fully aware of what's going on. And so it's very important to understand that the majority of us here are daily influenced, in fact, hourly and even minutely influenced by spirits. Many times when I'm talking, you'll notice a certain subject pop up and half of you feel like going to sleep. Right? You're being influenced by your spirit friends who don't want you to listen to that particular subject right at that moment. Or, or it could be that I'm boring. One of the two. Anyway, <laughs> let's assume it's the first one, right? I want to assume it's the first one. 
And so a lot of times what happens, and I've seen this happen in groups where a person puts up their hand, asks me a question, they're fully immersed. As I'm telling them the answer, I can see them shutting down. And five minutes later, they're asleep in the audience. That same person who was fully engaged just moments before. And all the time I could just see this little spirit, and I say a little spirit, often they're not that little, but these spirit influencing them, causing them to shut down, not wanting to hear a certain thing. Now, why do spirits do that? We'll talk about that in a minute, why they do that. Oh, I said uh, Harry was next to me, didn't I? But go on. Hello, AJ. Hello. I'm just wondering, how does the IVF system work in this? Sorry, how does the... IVF system work with this? Um, it's been a question I've answered before, actually, in quite a number of uh, presentations. Um, with, with difficulty, can I say, this is why a lot of uh, IVF doesn't take, what they call take, is because there's a lot of things going on emotionally. Firstly, why doesn't a couple conceive in the first place? It's because of specific emotions in the mother and father that the conception is not taking place. So a lot of people then say, oh, but no, it's to do with sperm count, and it's to do with this, and it's to do with that. No, it's not, I'm sorry. It's actually to do with specific emotions that created those effects. Right? And some of those effects are a low sperm count, or even no sperm, maybe, or you know, the egg not releasing, or all sorts of things can go on due to emotional injuries. Most of them are intergender-based emotional injuries. And so the couple not conceiving in the first place is often due to an emotional injury. Many of you have heard of couples not conceiving, they go through a whole IVF program, they conceive a child, and then nine months later they conceive another one. Why did that happen? Because certain emotional injuries got released during those two times, and that's why that happened. And emotional injuries are very specific about what they attract every single time. So if we want a child, we say we want a child, and we're not attracting a child, it's because of an emotional injury inside of us that is not attracting a child. Assuming, of course, we're making love and having sex. Uh, then, of course, if you're not having sex and you want a child, well, that's a different thing. You know, there's a different set of attractions there. Um, one of them is you don't want to have sex, obviously, and you need to adopt. But, <laughs> but, but I'm talking about the normal relationship thing going on. So that being said, a child, who go, a child is conceived through IVF still is conceived through the emotional condition of the parents who long for it. Does that make sense? So it's still governed by the same laws and the same principles. But the reason why many don't conceive is the same, the men, why, why many don't take, if you like, is, is the same reason why the couple can't conceive in the first place. Because what's going on might be for the woman or the man that they're actually investing a lot of their emotions in having a child and that they want to have a child for some unhealed emotional reason within themselves. And many children incarnating feel repelled by that emotion. Does that make sense? Well, you imagine, if you have a job before you start, many of you have been born and had a job before you began, and that job was to love your mummy or love your daddy. Right? And it's a terribly oppressive emotion. And it's an emotion that causes the rejection of the incarnation of children. And it also is the same emotion, similar types of emotions that cause miscarriages, of course. Those kind of emotions are felt at all sorts of times that cause miscarriages and lack of conception. Understand that everything that happens, happens because of a soul-based emotional cause. Very powerful to understand that. Yeah. Now, Harry was next, I think, wasn't he? And then we go up the back. I've just about forgotten my question now. Sorry, Harry. Um, I think earlier on you said when a guy and a girl get together, yep. you have a bunch of souls floating around looking, you know, waiting to see what happens. Uh, uh, they're attracted by the act of desire, or by the sexual desire right. um, expressed in both. So is there like a cue? And then how do yeah. they, how do they like decide? How do they decide, like, do they have a little sort of, do they flip a coin? How do they decide which soul you know, actually decides, gets the job? So. The soul doesn't decide, the soul coming in doesn't decide who gets the job. The soul coming in, 
that will get the connection will be the soul that's the exact personality requirement for those two parents at that particular moment. That's what's going to come in at that particular time. And so there is a queue of souls who match the requirements, if you like, but there will be one of those who match the requirements to the most perfect degree and that particular soul, or half of the soul, remember, will be the one that is incarnate into that body. We go up there, thanks. AJ, um, I'm curious about autism. So if uh, parents have emotional damage and there's an autistic child, if they clear their damage, does that child have a choice to be unautistic? Is your mic on? Can you just... Okay. Yeah. Did you, did you Can you ask it? the question again now? That yeah, um, I'm curious about autism. So yep. if parents have emotional damage and they clear that damage, does the child then become unautistic? Yes. Wow. Yes. You can experiment with that if you want. Um, I'm sure you will want if you have an autistic child. Um, what happens for an autistic child is that there is so much emotions coming to the child that it can't determine the difference between the emotions coming to it and its own emotions. And so what it starts doing is expressing moment by moment the emotions coming to it rather than its own emotions. In other words, it has so, because of its sensitivity, it has a very large difficulty in determining its own self awareness. Now, when the parents release different emotions that cause this barrage of emotions coming to the child, what will happen, and it's a very sensitive child already, obviously, the more, you'll notice actually over the last 20, 30 years, years children are much more sensitive. This is a growing fact because as mankind's condition rises in love, generally, then the children coming have less damage in love, so therefore they're less suppressed, right? So a child who's autistic has, has, you know, is a very sensitive child who's been incarnate into an environment and it's just feeling a barrage of emotions from its environment. And once you, as parents, release those emotions, the child will no longer be autistic. There's, a, there's some couples who have already started doing that. And I've had people who I've been with for years saying, what are you doing now? What's going on? And they say, oh, we're dealing with our emotions. No, I don't believe you. <laughs> and, you know, but the child is changing, the child, children are changing rapidly as a result of them dealing with their own emotions. Um, if we can bring the mic down. Since, hello? Since quite a while, I tried to ask you about Osho. Hmm? About? Osho. Uh, Osho. Did you ever hear about Osho? No, Bhagwan. Bhagwan. Uh, he's, a, an, he's a master in India. Right, okay. Osho. You must understand, just because I'm Jesus, I don't know six billion people. Yeah, yeah, okay. You must understand that. Do you know six billion people? <laughs> no. So I don't know six billion yeah. people. So you, yeah. like some of them I do know. So yep. he's very famous. Yep. And um, no worries. And okay. <laughs> um, I, I really experienced myself every time I wanted to ask you about him, and mm -hmm. because he got killed from the Americans. Maybe yep. you heard about this. No. Uh, no. <laughs> but go on, please. I want to ask you about Osho. There is a spirit around me who stops it. It's quite amazing for me to watch. And I have to really make that effort. So what's the spirit who is around you that stops the asking? Yeah. What are they feeling? Yeah. I feel my heart is beating. And, uh, so what's the feeling I, you my, have? I, I, I like to ask you in what sphere he is, but maybe you don't know. But, but can, you, can I ask you what your feeling is? Can you can you identify yeah. that feeling? What is that? Yeah. Uh, the feeling I shouldn't ask. Why? Why shouldn't you ask? Because in 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 that community there was a lot of uh, beautiful things happening, like meditation and self-realization and yeah. therapy and 
And but there was a lot, a lot of sexual activities. Right. And can and you see yeah. why the spirit doesn't want you to ask? Yeah. Because the spirit the... doesn't want you to know the truth of what was going on. Yeah. Why but wouldn't I... the spirit want you to know what the truth is? Yeah. Maybe because I don't want to know it. Because the spirit yeah. was involved in the sexual activity. Yeah. I, and if I, I say the truth to you and it gets known what was going on, then all of the people may no longer do the sexual activity that they were doing. And then all of the spirits who are invested in that sexual activity, yeah. what will, where true. will they be? Yeah, it's frustrated. Very... Sexually, they will be frustrated. <laughs> um, can you ask through a mic? Always through the mic. Yes. Sorry. Um, we can play the two. Sorry. I was just saying, are you implying that there's something wrong with that sexual activity? There's, no, I'm not implying there's something wrong with sexual activity. What I'm implying is that there's something wrong with sexual activity that you're not consenting to and knowing what you're consenting to. Are you saying in this case? Yes, this case, the people involved in the sexual activity have no idea that actually the spirits are influencing them to have sex with each other so the spirits can actually enjoy the sexual activity. With respect, isn't that an assumption on your part, though? No, it's not. But you can feel it is. But it's just a statement. No, it's not. Like, I know what's going on. I can feel through the spirit why she doesn't want, the spirit doesn't want to I ask I feel it her. very strongly. You can feel that, right? I was just for me. And how does the spirit feel about you knowing this now? It's feeling I know it's the truth. Yep. So the spirit knows it's the truth. And but, I probably... I, but how does he believe. feel? Oh, he doesn't like it. Okay. Why he doesn't he like it? He can it. Why doesn't he want, it, not, want you to know it? Because uh, I've been involved in it. Yes. You're one of the people who were chosen to be involved in it through some emotional injuries. Yes. And see, what happens is the spirits, and I just, if I talk, like, when I answer a question, by the way, I'm answering it based on what I know. If I don't know, I will actually tell you I don't know. All right? What's happening is around every person, remember, is a group of spirits. So here is the physical dimension. So this is the physical dimension. Here is the spirit dimension. Now these spirits are all in the first sphere of the spirit dimension. You follow me? They're all in the lower regions of the first sphere of the spirit dimension. What you would classify as the hells, or you would have heard of as the hells. It's not a fiery torment place. It's not a place of... You know, like Dante's Inferno. It's not like that at all. What it is, is a place where people have yet to heal their unloving emotions. And their condition reflects the emotion and the location where they live reflects the emotion. So there are actually terrible, terrible places in the spirit world. You, some of you have seen the book, what, uh, the movie What Dreams May Come? Just yes. In the depths, remember he goes into hell to get his wife out of hell from the from a suicide and he passes through many different illustrative pictures of the hell and to be frank, there are places that look exactly like are depicted in that movie. Now, these spirits are in the very low regions of this first sphere and they do not want you to change. They do not want you to change because they are living vicariously through you in order to get some of their unhealed emotions satisfied. One of the largest unhealed emotions on this planet are emotions involving sexuality, right? where we have a lot of confusion, a lot of shame, a lot of all these kind of things, or we have a lot of the opposite type of emotions, where we're highly sexual, we don't care who it's with, what... And, and, or anything like that, we're just highly sexual all the time and that is another emotional injury. Now what a person does in the spirit world, and you'll see this happening a lot on earth where people are attracted to spirituality but often finish up being involved in sexual activities. Right? Now while certainly part of your soul progression is going to be about healing your sexual injuries, and certainly, God designed you to have sexual activity. God also designed a whole group of laws of love surrounding it. And whenever you break those laws of love, certain things will occur. Now, one of the things that occur on earth is that in the guise of spirituality, 
sexuality gets expressed. And when I say in the guise, it's often said, oh, you know, love means free love, means loving everyone, and that means having sex with everyone. And so what we finish up doing is having sex with everyone because we're all freely loving each other. That's not what God designed. Now, you don't have to trust me. You can just find it out for yourself by doing the opposite and see where it takes you and see where it fulfills you and see whether you feel loved from it all. And you will soon find out that it actually isn't a loving space. But what's happening is these groups of spirits are here in the spirit world, lots and lots of them, all with unresolved sexual issues. There are many men, by the way, in the spirit world who were sexual predators here on earth and remain sexual predators in the first sphere of the spirit world. And what they do is they connect with women, and what, what is one thing women are generally attracted to? Spirituality. Agreed? You go to an audience where, like here it's a mixed audience, but generally when you go to an audience where there's spiritual things being presented, 80% of the people are women generally, right? So a lot of women get attracted to it. And then they're taught, often by a man by the way, that this free love idea and free, free sex idea and so forth, and what's going on is that these spirits in very low conditions are using that to influence you in order so that they can vicariously experience the sexual act through you. That's what they're doing. By the way, alcoholic spirits do exactly the same thing. So people who are alcoholics on earth, who love their drink when they're on earth, pass in the spirit world, there's no drink there, so what do they do? They just connect to a person on earth who's a drinker and they drink and drink and drink. And this is why the person can be totally oblivious to everything going on inside of themselves. They don't even know where they are, what they're doing or anything. They can't even remember last night. And yet when they ask a friend, yeah, you were still upright, still plugging away there, mate, you know? And the reason why is because the spirit was just keeping them pouring down the spirit, like two different types of spirit, but you know, the spirit was just helping them. Now, most spirits in a first fear condition do not want you to know this and, want, and would rather that you never found out about it. And can you understand why? Because they have a vested interest in you continuing to do it. They have a vested interest in it. So many of us in our life have had these experiences where we weren't conscious of what we were doing. A lot of times it's with alcohol or with drugs but oftentimes it's also with sex and other experiences. And most of the time it's because of the heavy influence of spirits in a very, very poor state. How do you disconnect from them? The same way you progress. By actually loving yourself, working your way through the injuries you have about love, and as that happens you work your way through the injuries you have about sex, and as that happens these spirits feel, oh, I can't connect with her anymore. I'll go and find somebody else who I can influence into, into doing this with. And they, and they often do because there is a large variety of people who have these injuries on earth. Now, you will find that there are many sexual predators in so-called spiritual circles. And the reason why is because these spirits, because of the other practices you know, the practices of meditation and other practices, find it easier to connect to the person when they're doing those practices. Right? And because the actual soul condition of the person isn't growing that causes a repulsion of those practices, those practices are attracted and then performed. Right? Thank you, Aja. This is so profound. <laughs> now, how is the spirit with you feeling? No. Hmm. He's gone, hasn't he? Nice. He's been with you a long time and he's just gone. Yeah. Yeah. And the reason why is because he's saying the penny's dropping with you and he can see the penny dropping with you and he can see that he's not going to be able to influence you to do this anymore and he's like, he'll just find another person he can do, do it with. He wasn't interested in you in any other way than to help you have sexual activity so that he could fulfill his own desires. Uh, I need to say something about that because I've been monogam since seven years now. Yeah. But he must have been still somewhere. Still with you. Still, because I had that um, for quite a while now, no sex. Yep. 
So he's been trying to influence you back into that. I felt or said, no, I don't want to. I mean, my my partner suffered a little bit the last two years. Yeah. But there was something within me was no. And you will find you will what you will probably find now is you you work through this issue and you'll feel like having sex again because at the soul level you you already (laughs) yeah. (laughs) That's great. You will. <laughs> you already knew that something was wrong here, and that's why you withdrew from it a bit. So, yeah. connect back with yourself when you're making love. Don't get out of body. Don't do those out of body things that you were taught to do when you're doing it. And you'll find that it'll be more of a real experience, and and there might be emotions you need to work your way through. The problem is that a lot of spiritual practices on earth are designed by spirits to help you be more connected to them so that they can use you more. And so you need to be careful of that. They are just as influential, these spirits. And uh, they, remember, every influence on you is emotional. Right? Everything. Wouldn't it be a great idea if someone opened up a clinic in that low-level sphere for those poor degenerative... Uh... <laughs> Spirits. I mean, it's a great business opportunity to help those spirits out so they don't pick on people like you anymore. Yeah, spot on, Harry. We're going to open clinics in the future for exactly that purpose, to be frank, honestly. The reason why is because higher spirits have find it very, very difficult to connect to these spirits to stop them doing what they're doing. You know, if a person's rampantly doing what they're doing, it's very, very hard to influence them, right? to stop doing what they're doing, free will and everything. But what happens is if a person from the earth talks about them and exposes what they're doing to them and talks about how they can do it differently, then there is a high likelihood these spirits will change and do something different. And so what we need on earth is a large group of mediums who understand the complete divine truth about the universe and understand how to assist these spirits to go from their condition to a new condition. And when they do that, they will disconnect from people on the earth. And do you know that the majority of our fatal diseases are even caused by this spirit connection? So lots of diseases will automatically stop occurring and a lot of influence like sexual-based influence and so forth will automatically occur. Sorry? And AIDS is uh, caused through, again, emotional injuries. So we'll talk about the emotional injuries of all sorts of diseases at another time. But all, remember, just remember the one truth, and that is that all diseases, all, and, and I'm going to be very specific here, every single event that's ever happened in your life, every single thing you did, every single disease you contracted, every single sickness you had, every single bone you broke, all happened because of an emotional cause. And that created a law of attraction that created the event. If we understand that, then we start to understand the power of changing the condition that creates those things. In other words, addressing the causes. On earth today, we are addicted to dealing with effects. Like, how popular is alcohol on earth? In Australia? Very popular, right? Why? Because we're addicted to dealing with the effects of stress and pressures in a way that calms us down. We feel that we've still got to do our life, and so what we do is we pick up habits along the way that help us deal with our life. But the truth is we're not dealing with the underlying emotional reasons why we do that or the emotional reasons why our life is the way it is. When we deal with those, everything gets ironed out and you no longer feel like doing things a certain way. Like most people are not aware that, for instance, coffee is an antidepressant, right? Most people are not aware of that. So what happens when we have coffee? Like if we're addicted to coffee, we have three, four drinks a day, we're actually using our coffee to avoid emotions. Right? Now you notice it. You go off of coffee for, coffee for one month if you're addicted to coffee, and see where your emotions go. Right? Now, the same applies to a lot of smoking, right? 
we're addicted to smoking usually for particular emotional reasons. The proof is you go off the cigarettes and you find out how good things are the next 14 days. You'll start feeling a lot of those causal emotions. And you'll start, if you allow yourself to notice them, you, you can address them. Understand that spirits around you are connecting to you not from any other thing than your law of attraction. Your law of attraction is governed by this thing called soul condition. The soul condition is the sum total of all of your experiences and all of your denied emotions and all of your expressed emotions, all of your desires, all of your passions, all of your longings, all of your emotional errors and injuries about love sum together to create your soul condition. That soul condition is like a huge magnet going out into the universe and it creates your life. Your whole life is governed by this, your soul condition. You even being here today is governed by your soul condition. Everything in your life is governed by this soul condition, all the attractions. Now, if you can understand that, you can understand how to change your life much more rapidly than trying hard to change your life from a day-to-day process, right? As long as you understand what is involved in your soul condition. Spirits love you being with unhealed emotions. Now, many of you have experienced a time when you've got into a rage and all of a sudden it's just like, it's now a real, like, violent rage that you've, How many of you experienced that? I know I have on a few occasions in this life. In that state, a spirit's just connected to that anger that you're that's suppressing an underlying grief and then expressing his own rage via your rage. And it does feel like sometimes, doesn't it, that you're actually out of control, that somebody else is controlling you in that state. And the the truth is that generally, whenever you feel like you're out of control, Generally, there is someone else controlling you or influencing you, and it's a spirit who is connecting to your denied emotional state. If we can have Mike just there. Um, could I ask you about soulmates again, please? Yep. Is, um, uh, is there any questions, firstly, about the spirit interaction that people want to ask first? Because then we'll go back to the soulmates. Spirit interaction questions? Spirit interaction questions? And then we'll come back to your soulmate question. You need to use the mic. Uh, Can one um, establish a healthy connection with the spirit? Yes, you can establish healthy connections with spirits. So there are many spirits who are in the higher dimensions of spirit world who would love to connect with you and teach you a lot of emotional truths. And every single one of you is capable of listening to them if you deal with certain emotional injuries. So there are, there are literally billions of spirits in the higher spheres who would love to connect to you and talk to you about all sorts of matters. But you're not going to connect to them easily unless your condition gets near their condition or you at least start understanding some of the moral principles and laws that affect that connection. Okay. Yeah. So a working process. So yeah, the more we progress spiritually, the better the connection with spirits at a higher level are going to be. Good. All right, now back to that, about the sign that question. You'll have to hold it nice and close there. Um, when two people meet and they they feel they're soulmates mm-hmm. and they... Um, um, then for some reason things go wrong with them um, and often I'm just thinking the man um, becomes abusive and um, the relationship uh, becomes very difficult then the woman may leave and then but often the person still loves that person and they will continue to go back. Uh, Why is that, that sometimes people can love someone who's really abusive Mm -hmm. and um, they go back into the same situation time time and again? It's due to unhealed 
self-love. Always. It doesn't matter whether the person's your soulmate or not. If a person's treating you badly, you would never go back until they've actually dealt with the underlying emotional reason why they want to, and they'd never do it again if they'd done that. Until that point, if you go back, you have still got inside of yourself love of self issues that need to be healed. So allow them to be healed. Work on the love of self side of things. It's unhealed self-love is the greatest creator of most emotional pain. And most of us have that emotional pain because of our childhood. We learnt to not love ourselves. We had to do everything for everyone else, not ourselves, and so forth. All right. Um, what is the time, by the way? 4.30? Because yeah. um, there's a lot more to cover. <laughs> um, do you, do, you, do you mind if I keep going for a little bit more before we have a break? Okay. What I want to do is just describe to you what happens in your progression, if I can. Imagine these are spheres. Now, I'll draw them a bit tighter together this time because remember there's lots and lots of them. We're up to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, six, seven, eight, and then we go above eight to... I will just saw those lines in there and there's a 20... First sphere up there. Right. Remember, we, trans we transcend each sphere by growing in love. Okay? But there are two types of love we can grow in. One type is the love that you have that comes from within yourself. Okay? Now, I call that... Natural, oh, one line too high, two lines too high. Uh, 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 I call that natural love. You can think of natural love as the love that comes from within you that can be developed and shown and expressed to everything and everyone around you. In other words, love from within you that you express to your complete environment. Now, when we grow in natural love, we are building this love that's inside of ourselves. But there's another type of love we can grow, and that's the divine love. Now, most New Age paths and everything will say that the divine love is this divine spark within you. And I'm going to say to you that there is no divine spark in you. Until you ask God for that to occur, then there's one. You see, divine love, the reason why this is the case, is divine love is God's love. God has an emotion of love too. And God's love can be expressed and given to you. You follow me? That is not your love being developed, although you will develop in your love as you receive it. It is love that comes expressly from God only. And I and no other person on this in this universe can give you this love. Not a single person in this universe can give God's love via themselves to you. God's love can only enter your soul through one connection. And that's what I want to describe to you, is this connection that it can enter you. But firstly, what I want to do for a bit is just to describe to you the different types of love and how they're characterised. When we're developing in natural love, we become very intellectual. And the, in the spirit world, the spirits call themselves grown-ups, right? In the sense that they are grown up intellectually. They have super, super minds, super superior intellect, right? On the divine love path, we grow on an emotional level. So 
on the natural life path, we have a tendency to go into intellectual intelligence. On the divine life path, we forget about intellectual intelligence. And what we do is we go for emotional intelligence. Right. Now, many of you might know already that when you're emotionally intelligent, you're automatically intellectually intelligent. Right. And that is something that happens on the divine love path. You automatically become more intelligent as you grow because of the emotions that impact upon intelligence get released. There are literally emotions that impact on every part of your life, including how rapidly you respond to intellectual stimuli. And as you release your emotions, that becomes more and more rapid. On the natural love path, if we could call it, when we're growing in natural love, and by the way, every single religion on this planet almost is growing in natural love. And almost every single spiritual thing that you can hear from the spirit world is about natural love. And the reason why is because the divine love spirits all exist higher than the natural love spirits, and so therefore for us to hear them, we've got to already be in a certain state to learn the truths of them. But anyway, let's have a look at other things. What are some other things that are different on both paths? On the natural love path, I often say, I am God. Right? We become God. You see this a lot in the New Age movements, right? I am God. On a divine love path, I am God's child. And I forever remain such. And I don't ever view myself as God. So all those things that are said in the Bible that I somehow viewed myself as God or a part of God in the way that it's been interpreted nowadays are all untrue. I said I became at one with God, which is a totally different thing than saying that I am God. And every single being in this planet and every when I say being, every single soul, human soul on this planet, and every single soul that has passed over has the same ability as me to become at one with God. And there are literally now millions of spirits in the at one with God state. Many of you have heard of it as Christ consciousness. Well, please understand that the words are bandied around here on earth so much now that they all think they're Christ conscious, but they're not emotionally there. Right? So they don't really know what Christ consciousness is yet. When you are emotionally there, then you'll understand the difference between what's being said to you and the state of being Christ conscious. We'll talk about Christ consciousness in a minute, where it happens. Right? What other things do we notice on the natural love path? We're intellectual, we say, I'm God. There is literally thousands, and I've probably say millions, so let's millions, <laughs> of paths. You know how you hear people say, oh, yeah, I'm on my own path. Yep, no worries. It's one of the millions of natural love paths. Agreed? Like, I'm on my own path, I'm on my own personal truth. I'm on now, all of those statements are based of, are statements we would make when we're on the natural love path of which there are millions. When we're on the divine love path, there is the one way. It's the way of the heart, the one way. Right? I called it the narrow way, the narrow path. There is one path to it, one that we've got. And everyone goes, oh, here we go again, you know. <laughs> Somebody's saying that they are the only way to go... Oh, you know, and throw up their hands. I'm sorry, but it's the truth. I can't help the truth. All I can do is present it. It's a beautiful way because you know it's not even mine. Whose is it? Ah, it's God's. God created this way, the one way. God created it. God wants to teach you it. Does that make sense? You don't need me to learn it. You need God to learn it. 
That's how you, in fact, learn it. There's one path. Okay? On the natural love path, you'll find that when you, after you get on the divine love path and are really on it and start receiving divine love, and we'll talk about that process soon, once you're on the divine love path and you're receiving divine love, what will happen a lot is you'll start to recognize another person who's received it. Because what it does is it brings the people together who are all on the same path, even though they have a lot of different backgrounds. So the truth is you can be a Catholic and receive divine love. You can be a Muslim and receive divine love. You can be a New Age spiritualist and receive divine love. But you're going to have to give up your false beliefs about love to do it. That's the only way. That's the one way. And this one way, in the spirit world, in the eighth sphere and above, there are literally millions of different types of religious formats all represented, but they no longer have any of those religious formats. But do you know in the sixth sphere of the spirit world, sphere number six in the spirit world, there are still literally thousands of religions? There are many Catholics who have modified their Catholic beliefs to bring it more in harmony with natural love, and they're now still Catholics in the sixth sphere. There are many Muslims who have modified all of their natural, all of their beliefs in harmony with natural love, and they're in the sixth sphere, and even the leader of the Muslim religion who profited it, which was Muhammad, is in the sixth sphere himself. Or, there are many Buddhists who have followed the natural love path of Buddhism and are now in the sixth sphere. And in fact, Buddhist, Buddha himself is in the sixth sphere. But then there's other people, like Gandhi, who found the divine love path. And he was a Hindu. Now, he's not a Hindu anymore because the beliefs of the Hindu system is not, does not coincide with what he's learned about God's love. But he's in the 17th sphere. Now, the reason why these things occur is because many of the people who teach certain things on earth become addicted to those teachings and they don't want to feel their connection with God. What they do is they feel what they imagine to be God. And to be frank, we can fool ourselves into all sorts of states, including I can fool myself into being Jesus. All right? You can fool yourself into all sorts of states too. You're going to have to be very, very honest and open and frank and really honest with yourself if you want to connect to God, though, because with God you can only maintain a connection as long as you're in truth. And I'm not talking about your truth or my truth. With God you can only maintain a connection to God when, you, when you're in God's truth. And that's a big difference to being in my truth or in your truth. Can you see that? So on the divine love path, what happens? We can progress above the sixth sphere, but on the natural love path, we cannot. There are literally billions of spirits on the natural love path who have perfected their natural love, the love that they express from within themselves. They have perfected that love to the point of the sixth sphere. They've been there for thousands of years, and they're having a wide variety of experiences. And the dimensional space of the sixth sphere is expanding laterally because of those experiences. They are creating planets, they're creating solar systems, they're doing all sorts of very powerful things that you can't even imagine perhaps right now, but they are having a lateral experience of the universe. They believe themselves to be growing, but they are stagnant in their own progression at the soul level. On the divine love path, you progress beyond the sixth sphere and you enter a sphere of transition, which is called the seventh sphere. The seventh sphere is this sphere of transition between the, the, the human soul and the divine soul. And when you make the transition between the two souls, you enter this experience, which is called the new birth. You, if you were a Christian, would have heard it as being born again. In the first century, I said, you must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the seventh above the eighth sphere. I call this area the kingdom of man, and I call this area above the eighth sphere the kingdom of God. It's the kingdom of God because the only people that can be there are the people who have received divine love to the point where their soul has actually been physically transformed into a new creature 
and they experience this new birth. And when you experience the new birth, a whole lot of new capabilities come to you that you don't have before in your own soul. Your soul grows and expands into a new condition, into a new being. A question up the back there? If you can keep your hand up, Patrice. AJ, I was just wondering what the benefits of spiritual hospitals are in regards to over in South America. I don't know if you've heard of them. And where their spirits are or what's happening in that regard. Can we stay on topic for the moment, though? Sorry. Is it, no, it's not really related. I can answer the question, but, uh, but I feel I'd like to try and stay on this topic if we can. Do we all at some stage down the track end up in new birth? No. The new birth has to come from a decision inside of yourself to choose to receive God's love into your soul. It's not an intellectual choice either. It has to be an emotional choice, a longing for God's love from within. When I refer to prayer, that's what I'm talking about. Prayer is just a longing for God's love to enter your soul. There's only three things you'll need on this path, three things only. You don't need me, you don't need anybody else on this path. You need three things only. First thing, a longing for God's love to enter you. That's the first thing. Uh, And I mean a longing, not just, oh, I think I'd like to have God's love enter me, and it doesn't really matter, you know. I mean a longing, a real deep, fervent desire within yourself. You need that. You will also need a longing for God's truth to enter you. So that's the second thing you'll need, a longing for God's truth. In other words, I have to give up all of my errors emotionally. So if I have a belief about love that love sacrifices itself, I need to give up that emotion. If I have a belief about love that love doesn't engage in sex, I have to give up that emotion. If I have a belief about love that love always means doing what the other person wants. I need to give up that emotion. If I have a belief about love, that love means that I will always get what I want, I have to give up that emotion. There are so many, I could list a hundred emotions, a thousand maybe, or even more emotions that many of us may have that we have to give up on that path. So I have to have a longing for God's truth to enter me emotionally, not, not intellectually, emotionally. When God's truth enters me emotionally, I will automatically do what is loving. I won't have to try. I won't have to try and think, oh, what's loving? What's loving in this situation? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to for years. We won't feel like that at all in this state, right? In this state, what we do is we, we know. We don't even have to think. We know what loving would do. And we automatically feel drawn into doing it. Does that make sense to everyone? All right. Then... The third thing that we need is a quality that is the most neglected quality here on the planet. And it's the quality of humility. I want to define humility. Humility is the passionate desire to experience fully all of your own emotion without blame, judgment or condemnation of others. That's the three things we'll need. A longing for God's tr- love, a longing for God's truth, and humility. When you have those things, you will guaranteed progress on the divine love path. Now, I say three things, not very much to remember, hey. You try putting it into practice in your day-to-day life. And you'll find, actually, Wow, at the very first moment I just you know, said some untruth. Well, I'm straight away out of heart. You try it in the break. In the break, you know, when somebody snaffles that cake that you wanted. <laughs> right? If you were in truth, you would say, I wanted that cake. <laughs> Wouldn't you, if you felt that? And then you go to yourself, all right, what's my emotion? Oh, it's an emotion of missing out. I feel like I'm missing out on that cake. And then you'll, right at that moment, if you're in truth, You'll feel that emotion in a childlike way because that's another thing about these two paths. See, on this path, on this path, you're adult-like on the natural love path. 
on the diviner path, you are childlike. So you go, oh, <laughs> I missed out on that cake, isn't it terrible? And away you go, right? If that's how you felt in that moment, you would do that. If you are in that state. And what's going to happen on this planet is that some people, and then eventually quite a few people, are going to get in this state, and you'll see it in action in your day-to-day -day life. And you'll be amazed about how you can live your life that way in the world that we're currently living in, which is very, very different. The truth is that when you get into that state, you are the most powerful creator that you could ever be because everything is driven by desire and emotion. Everything, absolutely everything. And once you recognize the power of that state, you'll love it. You won't want to give it up for anything or anyone. Right? So if I came along and said, ah, oh, no, nah, no, nah, you know all that stuff I said about the divine love stuff, you know, ah, oh, no, no, you follow me instead and we'll go off on this tangent over here. You say, what? 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 Why would I want to do that for? Because you're already experiencing the state of complete connection with God. It's not a religion. It's not like something that you've got to follow with rules, although you will, in your heart, feel what's right and what's wrong instantly. Right? Nothing. And in fact, there are some Bible verses that refer to it, like in the, in the Old Testament. They helped me learn about it. And one of them said, the heart of stone becomes a heart of flesh. In other words, your heart, your feelings, your motivations, your emotions get transformed into this new state of being. You are sensitive emotionally and everything becomes an emotional experience, everything. And you will not be able to do anything that breaks your own integrity to yourself. Now you think about that. How many of us are doing a job at the moment that we don't want to do right? because we want to earn money? Well, when you get into this state of at-one-ment with God, this is this state in the eighth sphere, which is called at-one-ment with God. Right? When you get into that state, you will not be able to ever do that. And in fact, to be frank with you, by the time you probably get to the third sphere or the fourth sphere of progression, you will not be able to do it. Because you can't stay in something that's untruthful for you anymore. You just can't. It hurts so much that you just can't do it, so you don't. And then you go down the track of, oh, my fears, you know, now I've got my money coming in. What do I do now? And, and, well, that's an emotion, right? And so you deal with that emotion. How do you deal with that emotion? Oh, nobody's going to care for me anymore. No, 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 way I go, right? I feel that emotion and I release that completely. And, you know, when I come out of that, I'm going to think, what am I thinking about? Like, I've got a connection with God here. God's the creator of the universe. What am I thinking about? How can I believe that I'm not going to be cared for? But you'll only feel that when the emotions of a lack of abundance and all these other emotions are going to be released from you. That's when you'll feel it. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. So on this path, what happens is you become real, real. Everything is emotionally real. You don't intellectualize yourself and you do not reframe everything. You know, oh, that man punched me in the nose today. Oh, yeah, I know he's got some problems. What? Like, you've got some problems. What do you think your law of attraction is to attract somebody punching you in the nose? You need to have a look at that, you know, what's going on. Now, was it because you were in truth or was it because you were in error? If it was in truth, then fine, but if it was in error, what did you do in error to attract that? What was the emotion? Ah, it was the emotion of fear in me. It was an emotion that I believed my body might die. It was an emo Whatever the emotion is, I release. When I release that, those kind of events happen far less often. And what happens is as I progress more and more and more on the path, I start creating in very, very powerful ways, far more powerful than the intellectual try, 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 try. How many of us are sick of trying? I'm sick of trying. I don't know about you. I spent a lot of my life, this life, doing the trying. right? And the whole reason why I came back to experience this life because it's very different than the first century life I had because the whole life, my whole life in the first century, I didn't have to try. Right? And then I, wanted, I got up the spirit world and, I'm, and everyone else is coming to me, oh, do you know that feeling about trying to do... 
No, I'm sorry, I don't. You'll have to talk to Mary about that one. I've got no idea about that one. <laughs> you know, and, and I felt totally clueless because the majority of people were coming to me for help and I didn't even know the answers to the majority of their problems because I, their problems because I hadn't personally experienced them. And so I decided with Mary, because it's all union state is the only way you can come back to earth, that we return. And we decided to return. One of the reasons was so that I could at least get some more like knowledge of what it feels like to try and try and try and try. And it feels terrible. I don't know about you, but I hate it. It's like, I don't ever want to do it again. That's how I feel. And so when you're on this path, that's what you'll get to, the place where you won't have to ever do that again. Every th single thing you desire is harmonious with love, and so therefore it's automatically created in this state. In this state, you've got to think your way into it. Yeah, yep, no worries, what am I going to create? And away you go. And while it sounds all lovely, it's not very useful to you. Now, just before I ask another question, there's one other thing I'd like to talk about, the two things. This path is self-reliant. You think about it. How much on this earth has we, have we been taught and now come to believe that the only person that's going to get, do something for me is me? Right? That's what we, so we become so self-reliant, right? We base our entire life around it. I've got to create it. I've got to create it all the time. On this path, we are God-reliant. We trust, we trust that if I deal with my emotions, if I deal with my law of attraction and deal with the emotions that are attracting, if I work through my soul condition, if I grow in love, everything I want that I've ever dreamed of is going to be attracted to me. And you know what? When you get into that space, you won't even worry about any time at all in your life. You won't plan anything because you don't need to. The moment you want to go and have a chat with a group of people, they'll be there for you automatically. Now, I know it sounds strange, but it happens like that, exactly like that. Everything you want to create, everything you desire that's harmonious with love will happen. Now, sometimes the time period between you having the desire and it happening can be a bit of time, but it will happen. Because everything that happens, happens because of your desires fully expressed. And so on this path, I'm, emotion, I'm emotionally connected, God-reliant, childlike, having fun, enjoying myself, not thinking about, worrying about where my next penny is going to come from, where my next meal is going to come from. Does a child worry about those things? Like, no, no, they don't care about that. They know that a meal is going to get put on the table, right? So that's, they don't worry about that. So they, that's how we will be, exactly like that. You will get to this point and you'll look at a person who's in this point if you're coming from an intellectual perspective and say, how do they live their life? Like, What are they going to do tomorrow? And they say, I don't know. Oh, who knows what might happen to me tomorrow? Like, All sorts of things could happen to me tomorrow. I might have a desire tomorrow to do something. I might have a desire tomorrow to make love to my lovely lady all day. So who knows? Something might come up. Other, oh, Sorry about that. And I keep doing these. Something might happen that actually causes me to, to change that. You know, like my desires change at every moment, do they not? Depending on what emotions pass through me. And who knows what they will create. So why do I, why am I invested in that? I won't be invested in that on this path. On this path, I make lots of detailed plans, you know. I was like this. I was just like, you know, write down lists. Every night I used to do that. I used to write down a list of next day. What I do. How many of you have done that in your life? Write down a list of, yeah, so I'm not alone. So, so, so we write down a list of what's happening next day and then what do we do with it? Well, what I did with it is I wrote down a list of all the things that could have gone wrong with that list. No, fair thing, and that's what I did. I was so afraid of what would go wrong that I wrote down a list of all the things that could go wrong. I was pretty right in that when anything did go wrong, it was usually on my list, right? Anyway. And so I allowed myself, right, to write down this list. And then the next day, sure enough, yeah, that happened, that happened, that happened, cross, cross off, cross off, cross off. And whoa, well, yeah, that went wrong. Cross off that, cross off that. Right. All my life was that planned. It was terrible. Like, it was terrible. I, I, I was living, I was so full of fear 
that my stomach hurt so much every morning I woke up and I would be trembling every time I woke up in the morning. Who's had that emotion of feeling dread every single day of their life? That's what I was like, every single day. And it was only by releasing the causal emotions that created my fears, which in my case were all to do with my first century experience, that all that went. My lovely lady would like to say something. So would you say that the natural love path is typified by trying to control our life and control our emotions? And control, yeah. And the divine love path is actually opening up to feeling everything? Yep. Definitely. As you know, darling. So you can say it differently. So feel everything on that path, yeah? Yeah. Exactly. That's exactly what it's like, isn't it? So in this state, I was just like a control freak. Right? And everything had to be even planned. Everything had to be just by every. And you know, in that state, uh, most things went wrong too, right? <laughs> because that was the state I was in. But in this state, now most things go right. Everything seems to just, oh, fit together. Oh, such and such wants us to go up to Mackay. Oh, okay. What date? Oh, the date I feel like going up is about December sometime. Oh, and they email back. Yeah, we've got a venue available, but it's only available. Isn't this terrible? It's only available on the exact week that I wanted to go up. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, this is what happens on the, when you're in this space all the time. Many of you have been in that space at different times of your life, right? But it can't create it all the time because of the emotions that cause it. Now what we'll do now is have a break. Uh, what is the time before we have a break? Five o'clock. Well, you talk too much, that's what the problem is. <laughs> and what we'll do is have a break. Quarter of an hour, is that alright? Is that going to be long enough? And then uh, we'll come back, that'll be good. There's been a question of what happens to the soulmates as they progress. All right, so I'd like to address that issue because it actually affects the teaching of reincarnation, actually. So how many of you firmly believe in reincarnation as you've been taught it from, say, similar to Buddhist or Hindu-type teachings, New Age-type teachings, where you reincarnate over and over and over and over? How many? Quite a, quite a number? Good. All right. You'll find the next bit, bit confronting. Just a, just a forewarning for you. <clears throat> All right. So we're here on the earth and uh, we start having a longing for our soulmate. And what will happen in your progression is as you start progressing, you will actually start working your way through different emotional issues that cause, that cause you to currently have soulmate blockages. Like, if you're needy for your soulmate, that's a blockage, by the way. Nobody wants to live in a needy relationship, right? So if you're needy for your soulmate, that's a blockage, it's an emotional blockage. If you have an uh, emotion, emotion inside of you that you're angry with men and you're a woman and you know your soulmate's a man, then that's a blockage towards you meeting your soulmate. If you have an emotion inside of you and you're a man where you think that, oh, pretty much having sex with any woman will do, well, that's a blockage emotional blockage within you that's going to stop you from actually being with your soulmate. Because the truth is that when you meet your soulmate and, and actually work through all of your emotional injuries, eventually what will happen is you will not desire another single person. You won't, you won't need your parents, you won't need your children, you won't need anybody else except God and your soulmate. Right? That's what will happen. Anyway, what happens when we're progressing? Let's say one half of the soul starts progressing on the divine love path. And by the way, soulmate union cannot ever occur on the natural love paths. In other words, if I stay on this kind of a path, I will never experience the complete soul union that I'm speaking to you about. You have to go through the process of the new birth. You have to get into it one with God. And then you have to process, progress for another 16 sphere, 14 spheres of progression of learning about divine love before you will actually get into this condition of complete soul union with your soulmate. Before then, it will feel pretty good, right? When I say pretty good, like it will blow you, most of you away just feeling it at the third sphere with your soulmate, let alone the one condition with your soulmate. But 
what will happen is if you do not progress on the divine love path, you will never experience the soul union state. All right? Now, the soul union state is the state where yourself and your soulmate no longer think or see or feel yourselves to be separate people. That's pretty challenging because that means dealing with all the emotions of control that you have inside of yourself, all the emotions of manipulation, all the emotions that you want to get your own way, all the, you know, all these emotions all get dealt with in this process of becoming at one with your soulmate. But as you progress, let's say one of the soulmates progress first. So she progresses on the divine love path. So she's progressing towards God, right? On the divine love path. Sooner or later what will happen is she'll work through all of the emotional blockages towards her soulmate. And once that occurs, the soulmate starts feeling this change. It's an automatic feeling that occurs in your soulmate, an automatic change. And the automatic change means that the soulmate now starts to be drawn automatically into your life. All right? And you start to be drawn towards wherever he or she is. And it happens without you thinking about it. You just feel drawn. So, and, you know, when we talk about soulmates, is a, usually it's a four-hour discussion, not so this is a very five-minute thing or ten-minute thing that we're talking about today. But later on we have other discussions and there's already like 50 or so discussions on the net you can download about all sorts of subjects and the soulmate discussion is one that we're yet to have, in fact, with everyone. But anyway, you're progressing towards your, your, towards God. You're drawing closer and closer to God. And as you're drawing closer to God, every emotional injury you have about yourself, every emotional injury you have about your about the opposite gender, every emotional injury, and remember emotional injuries are any are covered by anger and resentment and other emotions. So anytime you even feel a smidge of frustration with the opposite gender, right? Anytime you feel a smidge of anything from the opposite gender, what is going to happen is there's an emotional injury. Does that make sense? It's just a spillage of water, isn't it? Is that right? Or a plate. Oh, hot tea. Oh, hot tea. Good. All right. So as I'm progressing, I'm progressing towards God, and I'm the woman in this case, don't look too much like one, hopefully, but anyway, I'm progressing towards God and I'm the woman. And so what's happening is as I'm progressing, this desire starts building in me. This desire for my only partner, which is my other half, soulmate. What happens then is there's an awakening inside of their soul which causes them to feel drawn into my life if they're not already there. And they will be just drawn into my life. Whether they're a spirit or on earth, doesn't matter. They'll be drawn into my life somehow. I'll f my, the power of my soul will draw that to occur. And the awakening will occur between the two halves. And they don't even have to deal with any injuries. They'll be drawn. The problem with that, of course, is that they might come to us full of injuries. Like, how many of you have a soulmate that's a murderer? Everyone goes, no, 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 that's not my soulmate, right? My soulmate's not a murderer. Well, someone has to have a, like, the murderer as a soulmate. So, does that make sense? Like, so, you know, this is the trouble is what we do is we make judgments a lot, don't we, as to who our soulmate would be and who they are. But obviously, you know, there's, there's a whole, whole variety of people our soulmate could be. And it's just a matter of me growing towards God that will attract that soulmate into my life. So I don't have to go out seeking them. They will feel drawn into my life as I progress towards God. So as I do that, I'm progressing towards God and eventually my soulmate will come into my life. Now they might be full of emotions that they have not yet healed. You're going to have to be in a pretty good space dealing with that, aren't you? If you've already healed a lot of your emotions and you come up and your soulmate's got lots, let's say you're a female, you've worked through all your man stuff, all your man anger, all your resentment, all the other things, you've blood and blocked towards your soulmate and all these other emotions you've had to deal with in this process, and then you get to say, well, you start to feel quite good, and then all of a sudden your soulmate's attracted. Oh, he's got like rage with women. Rage. <laughs> rage. What, what are you going to do with that? <laughs> ah, you might feel like getting rid of him, for sure. Yeah. 
All right, so what would you do? You would actually be already in a state where you do not actually respond to man's rage. Right? Where it doesn't even affect you at all. He can't manipulate you, he can't control you. How's, how good's that going to be? Your soulmate's there, and no matter what state he gets into, you will be able to assist him in love. It doesn't mean you'll be with him sexually yet, because he's still, if he's got rage towards women, are you going to want to have sex with a man who's got rage towards women? Probably not, right? So you might not be with him sexually yet, but you would probably still sometimes be in his life and just see, let him develop his desire, let him develop his longing to be with you after you've met and let him work through his different emotional issues. And if you're in a state where you're humble, where you're owning all of your own emotional experience, you'll be able to cope with anything they dish out and you'll be able to stay in a space of self-love with them. And so what will happen if you do that is they will feel even drawn more to, to more to you. So they'll start progressing too and eventually they'll get onto the divine love path as well because the other part of this is that if I've received divine love in my soul, sooner or later my soulmate's going to want to do the same. If I haven't, then they might not. But if I have, then my soulmate will definitely want to do the same. So they start receiving divine love and progressing, and eventually you go through the process of the new birth. No one on earth has gone through it at this point except for myself, while they're on earth. All right? Well, I'm not saying this time either, by the way. I need to go through it again with this experience I'm in now. But in the first century, I was the, from then on, nobody has gone through the process of the new birth. When you go through it, when anybody around you goes through it, you'll know it. You'll feel it from it. It's a totally different condition and space. Okay? Yeah. Uh, it needs to be on the mic because otherwise it doesn't get recorded. Yeah. Uh, what about in, in, over the years, there's been a lot of so called enlightened beings? Yes. Yourself included? Um, I know I'm called an enlightened being, but I don't call myself. Well, that. perhaps you were in, the, in 2000 years ago. No. 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 So what would you consider a enlightened being? And part two of that is, wouldn't Buddha have been considered someone who's gone on the divine path? Of I know Buddha is considered by everyone else to be someone on the divine love path, but Buddha is actually on the natural love path in the sixth sphere. That's where he currently resides. So, so, so the truth is that Buddha, in his, in his, in, in his original concept, of, he doesn't have a concept of God that actually is God's concept of God. So Buddha's concept of God is totally different to God's concept of God. And that's why Buddha is not at one with God. All right. So are you saying you can be enlightened and not be with God? Everyone who's defined as a light enlightened is actually usually not on the divine love path. They're all people who believe themselves to be enlightened in the perfect condition of natural love in the sixth sphere. There are literally billions of spirits in what you would call an enlightened state, but it's not what I'm calling a, an at-one-ment state. That's totally different. So could you say what the difference is? Um, I've already stated some of the differences. One of them is this, is this thing where I say I'm an enlightened being. I'm sorry, I'm not an enlightened being. I never was. In the first century, I wasn't an enlightened being. Does that make sense? In the first century, all I was was the same as what you are, a child of God who went through this process of the new birth into a condition of atonement. I'm still God's child. I don't want you to connect to me because I'm some enlightened being. I want you to connect to God because God's the enlightened being and no one else really is. And particularly all the people who claim themselves to be an enlightened being are not enlightened beings really. Now the enlightened being and a lot of other terminologies are all about how they describe their progression on the natural love path. Does that make sense? So, it's, it, and the problem is, is that there are whole groups of spirits who were with us here today, who are prompting many of your questions, who believe themselves to be light, enlightened beings. And th the truth is that they are on the natural love path in the sixth sphere of their development, and they're not yet even making the transition because they still think they understand the divine love path, but they haven't experienced it emotionally. And when they allow themselves to experience it emotionally, they will know the difference. But it's like you. How do I get you to experience love? I can't get you to experience I can talk about love all day, 
but I can't get you to feel the emotions of love for God, for example, can I? I can talk to you about if you love God and you think, yeah, I think I love God, but you know, until you feel this passionate desire and longing for God, you will not feel what it's like to love God, let alone to experience God's love to the condition of one The problem is that almost all of the so-called enlightened beings that have ever been on this planet have all been on the natural love path and many of them still are. Right? Because they don't want to give up their concept of self. Or they've given up their concept of self. So when I say don't want to give up their concept of self, I mean self-reliance. Or they've given it up so much that they've given up their free will. And on this path, you never give up your free will, ever. In fact, your free will multiplies and grows on this path. Remember, I said one of the reasons for incarnation is to fully realize your own free will. So giving it up is not going to be beneficial. What Buddha has done, he's, he's in the sixth sphere. I've met him many times in the spirit world. He's in the sixth sphere. He has given up the whole concept that he's an individual. He does not believe himself to be an individual anymore. And what he's doing is he's totally reliant on this concept that has overcome his being, that he's actually not an individual. He's now, in his own belief, become God in his own belief. And he is in a six-fear state in that belief. It's very, very hard to talk to him. It's almost impossible to convince him anything other than what he believes in that state. And this is the problem, is that many of the so-called leaders who were looked up to here on earth and who have been looked up to for years and generations are actually in that state. All I am is your brother and all I've done is done the same as what I'm just saying to you, you can do. And I'm never going to be an enlightened individual. I'm never going to call myself that. I'm never going to call myself a guru. I'm never going to call myself an avatar. I am not those things. All I am is the same as you. I am just a child of God right? who has received divine love in the same manner that I would like to describe to you that I've, you know, that you can receive it. That's all. That's all I am. Does that make sense? Now, you don't have to agree with me because you can actually pass or you can get mediums to talk to Buddha if you want. You will have a lot of trouble getting a medium to talk with Buddha because Buddha does not normally do that. But you might have to pass before you investigate and get to the sixth sphere yourself before you can investigate where he is. But I can tell you at the moment this is where he is. I'm hoping that with all the changes that occur on the earth coming up, with all the different things that are going to happen over the next 10 years or so, that he condition, but I've seen many people take many thousands of years from his condition to get into a different condition. Remember, I've lived 2,000 years, so I've seen many people stay in these states for 1,000 years at a time of this condition. And in the six fear condition, not wanting to change, believing very, very firmly a whole set of beliefs that lock them in the same place that you on earth believe is an enlightened condition and it's not. It's a condition of shutdown, emotional shutdown, and going into this so-called nirvanic bliss, which is actually, in many cases, just the projection of all the adulation and glorification from other people entering their soul. It's a very damaging place for them to exist in. Over there, if I can. Now, I know some of this is confronting, by the way, what I'm saying. You don't have to believe it, remember. AJ, I was just wondering about the Ascended Masters, like St. Germain, Skatumi, uh, the World um, Again, the definition on earth of Ascended Masters, yeah. every single person in the spirit world who's raised themselves, in terms of their connection with God, they actually feel that God's raised them into this condition of at don't call themselves an Ascended Master. They just don't. What? An ascended master, what does that really mean? Isn't that a sort of like a condition of glorification in the end? Saying, I'm the master, you're the slave is almost the implication, right? Nobody in that state calls themselves an ascended master. So is that just a human terminology? It's a, it's a human term in order to glorify generally a medium's connection to a certain spirit. Okay. 
and the person on earth needs to look at the emotion of what that is, and that's an emotion in them that they need to say to you, oh, aren't I wonderful? I'm connecting to the Ascended Master, Saint Germain. Now, Saint Germain is on the divine love path, and Saint Germain is in the celestial kingdom, but Saint Germain doesn't call as himself a Ascended Master. Yeah. So, like Francis, many of you have heard of St. Francis, right? Of Assisi. Same goes. Many of you will call him an ascended master. He doesn't call himself that at all. What about Kutumi? Well, this is a, this is a state with a lot of these, but, but bear in mind that many of what you call ascended masters are actually not ascended masters. There are people in the natural love state, in the six sphere state, who believe themselves to be ascended. And that's a very different condition than actually being at one with God. Because in, when you're in at one with God, you don't even call yourself ascended. It's a natural state every single person can get into. It's a state of humility, not a state of grandeur and power and all that stuff. You, you don't even think of any of those things in that state. You follow me? It's like, I do. can you see the difference? I do. If I'm, if I'm saying to you, look, I'm different to you, and... Um, you know, whatever I've done, you can't do. I'm an ascended master. I've always been there before you, whatever, whatever, and I rave on about that. And I don't believe inside of my heart that you could ever be where I've been. Then aren't I setting myself above you? Does God set me above you? No. God doesn't set me above you. I am a child of God. But those be. Not all the ones you've mentioned are, no. Okay. No. You know how you get these angel cards from Dorian Virtue or whatever, and you get many of the ones on those cards are actually in the sixth year natural love state, and some of the ones on those cards are in a divine love state. It just depends. Like a lot of times they're treated as ascended masters, but on the earth it's how we define things. We're always interested in defining things, right? Why? Because we're addicted to this emotion of comparing. We're addicted to this emotion of wanting to think that I'm better because I have this connection with this spirit, you know. I went and sit down with one spirit, and, oh, well, sorry, John, when he was here, sat down with one spirit, I can remember, with one medium, and he goes to sit down. This is the Apostle John, by the way. One of the, there is a group of seven souls who have returned to the earth, and Apostle John was one of those. He's now passed. But what happened was he went to a medium, sat down with the medium, and the medium said, oh, I'm, I've got Archangel Michael and Archangel Gabriel with me right now. What do you want to know? And Michael said, well, I'd like to ask them a few questions. Uh, sorry, John said, well, I'd like to ask them a few questions. How dare you ask them questions they're saying to me? How dare you? You've <laughs> Now, who, who responds like this if they're humble? So do you think this was a Archangel Michael and the Archangel Gabriel? Like you come up and ask me, you, you come up and ask me questions even about my own identity, and, and I let you just you like be condescending to me and everything, and I just say no worries. Like, <laughs> do you think, do you think an, a, a, an ascended, a, a person who's at a one condition, a person who's gone through all of their emotions, do you think they're going to be angry with you for asking a question? No. So who are they? Who are those spirits? They're not the people the medium and the spirits are claiming them to be. Because it's so easy, you know, when you connect to a medium, isn't it? You know, you imagine yourself being a spirit for a moment. You're invisible, right? Also, your condition, even if you're in the second sphere, is better than most mediums who you're connecting to. So can they tell who you are? Can they tell that you're in the seventh sphere, sixth sphere? You can say anything. Now, in the second sphere, you still haven't even learnt to tell the truth. <laughs> right? I mean, tell the truth all the time. Right? So, so the lady who's the medium or the man who's the medium says, oh, who is this? Come to me, please. Put, surround myself with all this light. And, and who, who, who's come to me now? And they say, I'm the Archangel Michael. And he's a liar. Like, he's not the Archangel Michael. He's in the second sphere and he hasn't even learnt to tell the truth yet. Right? But he's claiming to be the Archangel Michael because it gives him the sense of power and control and connection with this woman and unhealed emotions are what actually are drawing him anyway. So, so she's saying, oh, isn't that wonderful? I've got the Archangel Michael with me. You know? And then I ask a question about, uh, I want to know about reincarnation. Is that a truth? And he says, yes. Okay, okay, no worries. So we write down that truth. Does he know it's a truth? 
How would he know it's the truth? You don't know if he knows it's the truth. You're just trusting him because he's saying who he is. Now, honestly, I say who you are and you can see my face and you don't believe me. <laughs> Why do you then go to a spirit who you can't even see right, and then trust them saying that they are somebody? Can, can you see that? See, can you see how illogical that is? It's such an illogical thing to do. Like, you can't even believe someone who's right there staring you in the face. How can you believe somebody who's actually not even there that you can feel and you can't see them? How are you going to know who they are? Can you see you don't? You only know what they claim. And if they're not telling the truth, you don't know unless you can feel them telling a lie. Now, for you to feel them telling a lie, you know where you're going to have to be? You're going to have to at least be in the third sphere of your own development. Can you see that? Because that's the sphere where you learnt to, not, to, to always tell the truth. You're going to have to be there. You're going to have to be actually above where they are before you'll actually be able to see whether they're telling you the truth or not. You see, there's a general rule in the universe, and that is that unless you are in a condition of love that is either the same or greater than a condition of love that another person is in, you will not be able to see their emotional condition. It makes sense, doesn't it? You, it's always easy to see from, the, from, from above down, isn't it? Much, much harder to look up and, and see the truth. And this is the case on the earth. And see, all of us, many of us are looking up. The, the truth is mediumship is true. There is this connection you can have with spirit. You can talk to spirits all the time. That's, that's the truth of the universe. But don't believe that in doing that, that you're actually talking to the spirit who is claiming that they are somebody that you believe automatically. Don't, don't believe that that's the truth. They are a spirit who's come to you for a law of attraction reason. Allow yourself to work through whatever that law of attraction is. Anyway, let's get back to the soulmate, because that was a big aside. Let's get back to soulmates. We're, tra we're progressing, right? We're attracting our soulmate into our life. We go through the one condition. When you're in this one condition, your soul is so powerful that if your soulmate hasn't met you and they're on the earth yet, they're pretty insensitive, because they will have already been started to be attracted into your life, highly likely. So what happens is they start getting attracted into your life and they have emotions to work through, but because you're in a state that's very good, you can deal with these emotions with love all the time. Instead of, you know, they project a bit of woman anger, and what do you get? You project your ang man anger back, and it's just a matter then after that of who projects the anger the most as to who wins, right? Isn't that what happens, right? So, so now if I'm in a state of love and I'm a woman and the man's projecting this man and this woman anger at me, Oh, no, it's woman anger. I can feel what it is. I know what the cause is. I can help him identify it if he wants to. I can help him work through the emotion if he wants to. If he doesn't want to, I just say, sorry, I can't help you at the moment. Go away. Watch what he's doing in his life. He goes around and has sex with a few other women, gets tired of that, comes back to me, and I go through the emotion with him eventually. He'll come around. And I don't have any hurt about that at all. That's what I'll be in. That's the state I'll be in. So, so I'm attracting my soulmate. Now, what's happening above the eighth sphere? Remember, I said there's up to the twenty-first sphere here. There's a twenty-second sphere, which is the highest dimension or space at this point. There's a transition that occurs between the twenty-first and twenty-second sphere, and that's called the soul union. The soul combines, recombines into its original state. Remember, it started in this state way, 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 way back before incarnation. It started in this state. And now I'm back in this state, but there's a huge difference. I know exactly who I am. My soulmate and I know exactly who I am. She knows exactly who she is. When I say I am, we are both I am in that state. We become the one being again in that state. And in that state, I have this awesome potential and power that I never, because I've realized all of my abilities with regard to free will. And every single thing I do from the eighth sphere state onwards is harmonious with 
divine love. It's harmonious with the laws of the universe. And so I'm in this hugely powerful state of creation. And you know, you can only reincarnate from that place. Okay. Now that poses a lot of questions, doesn't it? But what about this reincarnation stuff? What about you go to the spirit world, you have your life review, you come back, you go to the spirit world, a life review, come back. We've all reincarnated, right? Conversations with God says we've reincarnated 600, he reincarnated 680 something times. And, you know, we all have. What's going on? What, what's AJ saying? And I'm saying categorically, you cannot reincarnate without firstly reaching the soul union state. And by the way, at some point when you deal with your emotions, if you have reincarnated, you will know and remember that state. And it won't be because some spirit's projecting it at you and telling you that it's that state. It'll be because you can feel you are in that state. And you'll have all these memories. You'll have firstly a whole, if you're in it, reincarnated, you will firstly a whole group. You will remember every little thing eventually about your first time you were here. And then you will remember all of your life in the spirit world, going through the spheres, of people you meet, everything. And then you'll remember the union state. You'll actually even remember what it felt like to reincarnate. And by the way, it doesn't feel very nice to reincarnate onto this planet in this time with these emotions. It's not very nice at all. But you'll remember all of that. Right? And you will understand the divine truth because the divine truth that I'm telling you, you would already know. And you'd probably even be already teaching it. Although it would be maybe very traumatic if you reincarnated into this state. We'll talk about the trauma at maybe another time. Now, if I'm in this state in the 22nd sphere, can you see why? In the 22nd sphere, I am back. I'm now this like super soul. He's like <laughs> super size me, right? So I'm now this super soul, if you like, and I'm not super for anything inside of myself. It's because of God's love that's entered me, that's transformed me. Does that make sense? So it's got nothing to do with how great I am or how good... You know, my soulmate is that got us there. It's just our desire to experience God's love that got us there. Right? It's divine love that got us into that state. So how could you ever say, oh, I'm so proud of myself. Oh, wow, I've, you know, I've done so much. I, you know, aren't I great? When God did it all for you, really. Right? This is why I'm a child of God. When we're in that state, we can now reincarnate. That's when we can reincarnate. Reincarnation, sorry. Um, can you just ask the question because it's an important one, but we'll get a mic. Yeah. Would you want to at that state? I mean, that's the question. Steve. Would you want it? What do you think? M most of the time, no. What's the only reason why you would want it? Love. Love is the only reason why you'd want it, to come back here to teach love. Right? That's the only reason why you'd want it. So when you come back, what happens? You come back to the earth and you're risking now going back. You are going to go back to the first fear condition because what happens? Remember what I said what happens when you first incarnate? You take all the emotional damage and everything from parents and situations, but now not only do you have that to deal with, you now have 2,000 years of emotional experiences which have now been, which were cleared, which are memories, now being reflected through that experience. Right? Now, does that sound pretty traumatic? Yes, it's very traumatic. For and in the future, sometime in the future, there will be people on Earth who are in an one condition. Do you think it's going to be traumatic then? No. To reincarnate then will be a breeze. You'll even remember from the moment you open your eyes. Oh, yeah, that's right. 
I'm Jesus, I can remember that. Right? It won't be this long, drawn-out emotional process you've got to go through before you have all of the memories of your life. That's what will occur. Everyone here is capable of doing this, by the way. No one's separate from that. Another question? But you would want to do it for love, definitely. Before you talked about um, the, the events that are going to happen in the near future over the next few years. Yep. Would you like to say something about that? Uh, probably not in this discussion. Um, so later on? Well, to me, they're not really a part of the secrets of the universe. Okay. I know many of you are interested because your personal lives are involved with them and all those kind of things. But um, I'm happy to talk about them in future discussions. Uh, but, but in reality, it's not very important. Now, everyone says, oh, look, we might have an earthquake here and there might be a flood and tidal wave. Who knows? And you're saying that's not very important and I'm saying, no, it's not. Because the truth is that what's important is your soul progression. Yes. That's what's important to me. Now, people think that, you know, there are times in history where I was on the battlefields of, you know, the First World War and the Second World War trying to help souls. I wasn't. I wasn't because they were in a battle that they didn't, they were in a battle, a physical battle, that wasn't even real. It's a battle of the soul that's the only real battle that you ever need to fight. The battle of the soul is how loving do you want to be or how unloving do you want to be? That's the battle of the soul in the end. And it's a, and, and it claims lots of torturous existences. There are literally billions of people who have passed from this earth in the spirit world and billions of people on this planet who are in a terrible, terrible, painful, suffering state because of this battle of the soul. Every other battle, physical on earth, means nothing in comparison to this soul progression that you can make. Now, can I just look at what's happened with this reincarnation thing? Right? What I'm saying to you is that Reincarnation can only occur from the 22nd sphere state and the first time someone reached the 22nd sphere state was 1935 of this century, of this previous century. And why 1935? Well, that's how long it took. The first soul to reach that state was, was our soul, myself and Mary. And it took 2,000 years for us to learn about God's truth. And we're slow learners. And that's why it took that long to reach from the 8th sphere state to the 22nd sphere state. Right? Now, after that, other souls came into that state. And then eventually there got to be seven souls in that state. And then those seven souls decided that because of all of these things coming up on the planet and because of God's plan and, and of course in that state you're at one with God, talking to God all the time, you know what God's plans are, we decided to return to the planet and to go through all the trauma and the emotional stuff and everything else and teach it through our own example of how to become at one with God as a part of the changes that are going to happen to this planet coming up. It's all been foretold, remember, hasn't it? It's all been foretold. It's all been prophesied from way, way historically that these events would occur and it's also been ironically foretold that myself and others would return. Now, what we decided to do was return. The first one of us returned in 1962. And then the second one returned, the third one returned, and so forth. And now there are other souls, other than those seven original souls, that have reached the one condition, and they're starting to return. And many of them for different reasons. But the first seven have returned specifically to teach the truths, the divine truths. Now you don't have to believe any of that. There will be a point in the future, if you progress on this path, where you know that to be true inside of yourself and you've experienced the truth of that. But you don't have to believe it right now. It doesn't affect you, in fact, right now. 
But all I'm doing is telling you the truth of reincarnation. Now that raises lots of questions about reincarnation. And so what we there is a whole discussion, a four hour discussion that we have about reincarnation. Answering all of the questions about reincarnation. Why is it then that I can remember some event? Why is it that you know I felt I was this person in a past life or that person in a past life? Why is it that when I did some past life regression, the person who took a photo of me photoed me and actually, you know, I've got a video of it. You know, why does that happen? What was going on? And there is an explanation. If there is the truth in anything, there is an explanation of absolute truth in everything that can be presented to you. The key is whether you want to investigate that or not, or whether you want to say, ah, oh, this reincarnation issue, that, you know, no, that's it. Can't accept the rest of it because of that issue. It's up to you what you do because it is your life. And you're allowed to believe in reincarnation for the rest of your life. By the way, there are still millions of spirits in the sixth sphere trying to reincarnate. And they believe totally the reincarnation that you've been presented through Buddhist or Hindu teachings or other philosophies, they believe totally in these philosophies. Totally. They have no um, doubt in their own minds that those things are true. But they are not true. Sorry? We can reincarnate. I've just told you we can. But only from the 22nd sphere state. Can we, uh, we need a mic, so, because otherwise our recording gear doesn't get it. What's the time, by the way? Yeah. Um, I'd like to know if we don't reincarnate, how are we going to get through all the spheres? Well, there's this, there's this false belief here on earth and in the spirit world that you have to reincarnate to get rid of karma. And it's not true. The truth is that you can progress just as rapidly on earth or even more rapidly in the spirit world and you don't have to come to earth to do it. All you need to do is work through the emotions that have caused you to be to arrive in the spirit world at a certain state. There are literally hundreds of thousands of spirits with us right now hearing this material and, I mean, who are wanting to reincarnate. Now, those spirits need to bear in mind that they don't have to. All they need to do is work through their emotional issues where they are right now. That's all they have to do. And when they do that, they will automatically grow into a new sphere of love. They don't have to reincarnate at all. And I can feel many of them even just hearing that, feeling like a sigh of relief. Because who wants to come back and reinfect yourself with stuff over and over and over and over again, working through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lives here on the earth when you can just do it in one. Why would you want to do that? You wouldn't want to, would you? No. So, so, so the best thing to do is... See, the, the truth is always beautiful. The truth is always loving. I just thought, of, you know, when I first... Like, I've never believed in reincarnation. So that might sound funny, but anyway, I've never believed in it. The thing, the, in the way that it's been presented on the earth, because, because for this reason, and even in, when I was in the spirit world, I never believed in it. By the way, um, and there's channeled messages actually that you can read from me that I've never believed in it. But anyway, I've never believed in it because it's an unloving teaching, and God never does anything unloving. God always does things in the most direct, beautiful way. God never is unloving. God never creates a law that's unloving. Now, like, let's listen, listen to the law of reincarnation as it's proposed by most religious forms or New Age. I live a life on earth. My life on earth, I do lots of damage to myself and other people. I go to the spirit world with all this damage. I have a big life review. Now I've got to work through the karma, the damage that I did, by returning back to earth. I return back to earth. But, oh, by the way, God's going to rub out all your memory of what happened in the last life and all the things you did do wrong in this process. So not only now do I have to deal with my karma from my previous life, I can't remember the karma that I have to deal with. <laughs> right? Now, oh, yeah, that's right. Now I've got a spirit with me. Yes, he, she's telling me that I actually was Joan of Arc in the, and... and, and yeah, but how does that help me deal with my karma? What did I do as Joan of Arc? Did I 
Did I slaughter people? Yes, I did. I murdered people when I was Joan of Arc. Right, what kind of karma do I have to work through now about that? I don't know, I can't connect to that emotionally. So how do I work through it? Can you see there's so much, there's so much error in the teaching as it's presented to you? But, but the trouble with the mind is this. When something all sounds logical to the mind, we then go ahead and believe it. Even though we don't understand that our mind's logic is based upon our emotional error. We are often highly illogical in our mind because of an emotional error that exists in our soul. Does that make sense? Yes. Can I ask if, um, if we clear our own emotions and yep. we go into divine love, does that clear all our DNA for all our relatives that have given us all our Yes, it clears everything because the beauty of your soul development is your soul drives everything that's happening to your spirit body and everything that's happening to your physical body. So there's spirits here in this room at the moment that have huge crosses and fissures all over their body. They look a mess. They look in the mirror and they can't stand the sight of themselves. And I'm saying to those spirits, just like I'm saying to you, that you can progress from that state without coming to back to earth by just dealing with your emotions and connecting with God, receiving divine love. And... You will do that if you continue to do that and release those emotions. Your bodies, whether they are a spirit body or a material body, will automatically repair. And it will repair so much that you will grow young again. But I'm talking about other people that have given us these problems in some cases. Like doesn't parents, matter. Grandparents, Whatever is in my soul unexperienced, as soon as I allow the experience of it, I will release it. It doesn't matter where it came from. But will it help to release it for them as well? Um, not no. necessarily. They've got their free will, so they're allowed to decide to hold on to it if they want to. It can help them a lot, but it may not. If it's our children, yes, it will help them immensely because most of their injuries were created by my own denial of my own injuries. So, of course, with our children, it will help them work through everything very rapidly. But it may not too. It's their free will. They have free will. They're allowed to make the choices they make. They're allowed to not deal with their emotions. Now, um, what I'm going to have to do, because we need to pack up and, and we've only actually booked it to 6 o'clock, um, so what we're going to have to do tonight is finish it now. And if you're welcome to come along tomorrow, and, I'm, and tomorrow is more like a question and answer session, and I'll present a few more details about the secrets of the universe in that session, but you're welcome to come along tomorrow. Same kind of thing, same kind of format. And if you want to bring some food, it, there'll be some food here available as well during the, during the day. We'll start at one o'clock. But I'd like to thank you very much for your attention and your beautiful way you've treated me. <laughs>